So some of you were not here last week. Um, so I, I have another. So last week I shared about our garage door opener and how a little it was, it was driving us nuts. And then I, I was trying to figure out com, com, complicated solutions to deal with it. And then I realized a really, very simple, easy way to deal with it, and our life got so much better. Well, today I want to talk about toothbrushes. <laughs> so um, for years, you know, when Jesse and I got married, we uh, you know we would got a little plastic cup and we put our toothbrushes in there. And then when we added a kid, we had three toothbrushes, and then we had more kids, we got more toothbrushes. And um, after, you know, now we have seven kids, and so we had uh, nine toothbrushes in a little plastic cup. And um, it was really frustrating us because whenever, you know, it's hard, Brian and Kathy know this, the toothbrushes, there's only certain, uh, so many uh, colors of toothbrushes out there. And so many times we go to grab a toothbrush, and I, you, somebody might think they're grabbing the green toothbrush, but they're grabbing the green, with a white stripe toothbrush. And then suddenly somebody's used my toothbrush and Brian will tell you how, how, how much that bothers me. <laughs> so people were using other people's toothbrushes and they're not admitting it. And, like, and then also sometimes you go to grab a toothbrush and then because they're all crammed in there, you grab one and there's eight that jump out on the floor and now you gotta wash eight toothbrushes and sometimes because it's a little plastic cup, it's a little tippy, sometimes it tips over and our um, sink's next to the toilet. No, that never happened, but... I'm never worried about somebody I know. <laughs> no, it would, it would never, it never, as far as I'm aware, it never fell in the toilet, unless some, it did and somebody didn't let me know, which I'm, another issue. Um, but it would tip over. <laughs> Wait, it did? Jesse rose her... Oh, I thought that, my wife rose her hand. I thought she was like, confessing right now. Yeah, it did one time. I'm like, hold on, I'm going to Arizona by myself today. <laughs> Um, but you know, so for, for, for years we were, at first it was okay, and then it got worse and worse and worse, and then we were just dealing with this, and we're like, this is a main hassle. Every time I go to brush my teeth now, I'm thinking about whose toothbrush am I accidentally going to use this time, and how many toothbrushes are going to wind up on the floor. It was, a really, it was just driving me nuts. And so then I started looking online for, like, I said, okay, maybe we'll buy something more than a 50 cent little plastic cup. Maybe I'll find, like, a real toothbrush holder. So I was looking for different options and, like, even willing to spend, like, real money, which is a miracle. You know, um, I thought, maybe I'll spend 15 bucks and buy a real one. Well, they're not, they don't build toothbrush holders for nine toothbrushes. <laughs> But so then I started thinking, maybe I can make one. Maybe I'll get some wood, drill some holes. And then I had different ideas and plans. I was looking up some, some plans and things. And, and so I had all these ideas. And then, though, I, I, we, I magically solved our problem by opening the cupboard. And I saw two ugly coffee mugs that nobody liked, the Menards one, and then I don't remember the other one. And I thought, nobody likes these mugs. They're really ugly. We should just use these for the toothbrushes. And so now we have two mugs up there, and wow. the boy, I know, right? Boys on one side, girls on the other. So now we only need a certain small number of different colored toothbrushes, so nobody confuses their toothbrushes anymore. Um, they don't tip over because they're heavy mugs. So it's beautiful. Just this, this little thing, this little change radically improved my mental state. Not that I was like stressed all day, like thinking about, oh my gosh, the toothbrushes. But like, you know, those little things, sometimes they add up where, um, and you look at it, you're like, how do I fix this? And it's not just toothbrushes, but like every area of your life where you have all these little problems and then it seems like it's a huge, massive problem. But the reality is a lot of times you just make a little change, a little fix, and then everything can be solved. Um, so not, not just toothbrushes, but a lot of areas of our lives. Um, last week I shared four different things. Uh, I'm not going to review those if you want to hear about those. Um, and um, hear about Jake, the other white meat. You can check out the, uh, <laughs> the sermon online. Um, that was, I stole that joke from Brian, but, but I had to set up for it. And then Brian's like, you should have gone here. I'm like, yeah, I should have. That was awesome. Yes? Yeah, I finally uploaded yesterday. I saw that. Thank you. Yeah, um, Eli was w working all week on getting it uploaded. And finally yesterday, it, it, it was there. So, um, um, yeah, so you can go check that out online um, with four, four, four of the ten simple things that will change your life. Um, all right, and so now I'm going to just do five through ten. So number five, set aside daily time with God. Um, you know, does the Bible say you have to meet with God every day? No. Um, but my recommendation is do it. Um, you need time with God. You need time alone with God. You need quiet time with God, where it's just you and God. Uh, I've been very surprised over the past like month or so, the number of Christians that have told me um, 
you know, we're talking about meeting with God. And say, well, how often do you, how much time do you spend with God? Or how often do you meet with God? And their responses are similar to, well, you know, when I'm going to work, on my drive to work, I think about God. It's like, yeah, think about God while you're piloting this, this, this vehicle full of gas, highly explosive gasoline and trying not to hit other people. You're not really getting quality time with God there. Or, well, you know, when there's a need, I pray and I ask him to help with my need. It's like, what, what kind of a relationship is that? That God, you look at God like he's a vending machine. Like you kind of ignore it until you got the munchies. And then you go to the vending machine, you get what you need. Um, if you treat your, your husband or your wife that way, that's a, a ridiculously terrible relationship. Um, you don't treat God that way. So I've been surprised at the number of people, Christians, recently that have told me, yeah, essentially, I don't really spend time with God once in a while throughout the day. You know, I think about him, you know, and, and he's at the top of my mind while I'm doing other stuff. And you need concentrated, focused time alone with God. You need to hear his voice. You need to, you need to develop a relationship with God. You need to study the word of God. You need to get in the word of God. Read it. Listen to it. You know, if you have an audio Bible, listen to the audio Bible. Sing it. There's plenty of uh, like old hymns and even modern worship songs that are based straight out of Scripture. Um, sing the Scriptures. Uh, memorize it. Get in the Word of God. Get in prayer. You, and more, when I talk about pray, prayer, um, more, no, I'm not so much saying, hey, you need to like ask God for stuff. That comes up in any relationship especially if you're in a relationship with the king of the universe, you're going to ask him for things because he's the king of the universe and he can, he can provide, he can take care of you. And he says, ask of me and I'll give you the nations for your inheritance. I'll give you this, that, I'll bless you. But so so there, that is part of spending time with God. You will ask God for things, but more than that, you need to develop a relationship with God where you're listening to God, you're hearing his voice many times. So I, sp I spend... Um, it, it, the, the way we, Jesse and I do it, uh, we, we wake up about 6 o'clock, and Jesse spends from like 6 to 7.30 or so um, meeting with God, and then I take over after that. Um, but that time, you know, 6 to 7.30, or me, mine varies. It might be like 7.30 to 10, might be 7.30 to 8, and then I'll meet later on. But we set aside the morning. We're like, before things get busy, before you start getting off on your day, we're going to work, going on errands, all that, we set aside our time in the morning. We're where we have just me and Jesus. So when Jesse's meeting with God, she's in the room by herself. Nobody's allowed to go in there and hassle her. When I'm meeting with God, I'm alone with Jesus. Nobody's allowed to come in there. Um, you need that. You need to develop a relationship with your father, and that's not going to happen. It, does, it happens throughout the course of the day. Yes, he's with you everywhere. And yes, keep thinking about him all the time. Keep meditating on the scriptures all the time. Keep you know, asking him for things when you need it. That's good, but on top of that, that can't be all you do. You need time with your father. Um, and so a lot of the time, a lot of the time when, I, when I spend time with God, I study the Bible, I, pr I read the Bible, I study it, I meditate on it, I pray some of the things back to him, I think about it, and then, then I just sit and I, I close my eyes, I put on some white noise actually, um, and I just close my eyes and I sit before God. And sometimes I'll visualize, imagine in my mind that I'm sitting on the Sea of Galilee, where it's nice and warm, there's no snow, um, I'm on the beach, Jesus is sitting next to me, and I just visualize that. And then I see myself talking to Jesus, and then Jesus starts talking to me, and it's usually, well, it's always really good. I was going to say, it's usually really good. No, it's never been bad. <laughs> it's always encouraging. It's always good stuff. Um, sometimes, I just see, I picture me and Jesus, this, you don't have to do this, it's, but this is, it's helpful for me because I'm a very visual person. So it's helpful for me to see something. Otherwise, if I sit there quietly, I start seeing, oh, look, there's an elephant with wings. And why is there an elf riding its back? I don't know. Um, so if I focus on Jesus in my mind, that helps me stay focused as I pray. And, and then, but sometimes when I picture us, I, I just say, hey, Jesus, what's up? And he's like, not much. I'm doing good. I love you. You know, everything's cool. And then we're just sitting there. And I don't say anything else to him. But I'm sitting with my father. You need that. You need to be with God. You need time in the Bible. You need time in prayer. Not with all the distractions of your life. And um, I highly recommend that you do it first thing in the morning when you wake up. You know, a lot of times, what do we do when we wake up? We, we grab our phone and we start reading Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, check our emails, uh, not the Bee, Daily Wire, Babylon Bee, I don't know, all the, the plethora of things where I'm like, we got to keep up with the news. We got to know what's going on in the, in the world. No, you need God. You need time in the Word of God. You need time in prayer. 
And sometimes that just means sit before God quietly and listen to him. Or maybe he's not even going to speak to you, but you just need to be there with him because his presence will change you. And sometimes with our kids, uh, some of our kids are very chatty, some of them are not. And so sometimes when we're driving someplace, you know, Jack or Cosette, if they're in the car, they're going to talk my ear off. But Ileana, May, Naomi, the older ones, sometimes we're just quiet, and that's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. We're being together, and, and, and we're building the relationship because we're together there, even if it's in silence, and that's okay. Same thing with God. You just need to be with God. You need to spend time with him. And you know, this is kind of like a, a, a no-brainer, dumb thing that it's like, we, I shouldn't have to tell Christians this, but um, I need to tell myself this, I need, and I'm a pastor. I should know. But there's many times where you know, I realize, man, I, I read my Bible, but did I really sit with God? Did I really hear God? Did I really spend time with God? Or I just, did I just read an old book? And, um, and there's a lot of times where I look at it, I'm like, man, today I just read an old book. Okay, God, I repent. I'm sorry. I need to be, be with you. Um, and it's easy, even at, like for a pastor, it's very easy for me to you know, read the Bible to prepare um, uh, messages or Bible studies or things like that, but not just be with God. So it's no... It's no, it's no easier if you're a pastor. And in, actually, in a lot of ways, it's probably easier to mess it up if you're a pastor. We have the same struggles, though. Um, so you need time with the Father. And it's kind of a st- stupid thing that we have to... It's stupid that we have to fight, that, we have, that it's such a war. Because if we think about it logically, we know who God is. We know how amazing he is. We know how powerful he is. We know how wise he is. We know that he's everywhere all the time. We know that he wants to bless us. And we know that good things happen when you're in his presence. We know he holds the universe together with his hands. We know that he can do anything we ask at any time. And so it's it's really, it's it's the height of pride to to, to know all this and to say, well, yeah, I don't really need that. I know I need that, but I'm going to do my life. I'm not going to carve out a little bit of time. I'm going to just get on with my life and make it happen. Man, it's pride, and we need to repent of that. So um, I want to really like, like hit that home. You need daily time with God. D- does the Bible say you have to be with God every day? Uh, that, uh, that if you don't meet with God in the morning every day, you know, you're in sin now. No, it doesn't say that. Um, there's times, though, where you know, King David in the Psalms says, um, I meet with you in the morning and noon and at night. I meet with you in, during the watches of the night. Um, the idea is you need God. If and, and honestly, if the morning doesn't work for you, if you're like, man, I've, I can't think in the morning, um, okay, fine. Take, do, do something at night or in the afternoon, whatever. But I recommend morning because that, if you don't do it in the morning, this is my, my, um, what happens for me. If I don't meet with God in the morning, I'm not going to meet with him throughout the day because things come up. Life happens. And then at the end of the day, at, at the end of the day you look back and you're like, man, I did all this stuff, but I never met with the king of the universe. You need daily time with God. Um, so how much, how much time should you spend with God? Um, well, if you were to, you know, the, a lot of people think about with their money, giving God a tithe of their money. Well, what if you were to give a tithe of your time to God? What would that be? It's out of 24 hours, 2.4 hours, which if you're not good at math, uh, that's two hours and 24 minutes. Uh, I, did, I used a calculator on that. Um, so if you were going to tithe your day to God, which... You know, we think about a tithe, and it's like, okay, that's like the minimum with your money. Well, if you're going to tithe your day to God, two hours and 24 minutes with God. And for most of us, that's probably like, wow, are you serious? Two hours and 24 minutes? That's so much. Um, all right, do an hour. Do an hour with God. I, honestly, uh, all right, do what you can do, but I would not recommend a Christian do less than an hour with God. Does the Bible say you need an hour a day with God? No, but it's hard to stay focused on God. It's hard to have your mind clear. It's hard to have your heart full of love, especially now with the way the world is. It's crazy. The world is nuts, and it's very easy to just get either like angry right-winger, and that's not the heart of Jesus, or you get crazed uh, liberal. That's not the heart of Jesus. And if you're not spending that time with the Father, you're going to you're going to get astray somewhere. Um, and it, might just, it might be in sin. It might be you know, wrong attitudes and stuff. Or it might just be going into one of these weird attitudes where you, you're, you're, just, you're just crabby or you're crazy. Um, you don't want that. That's not the heart of Jesus. Crabby or crazy. <laughs> um, so, you know, my recommendation is carve out an hour a day with God. Um, can you get by with less? Sure. And there's been times, like, you know, we're on a mission trip and... Um, 
there's been times where it's like we're just go, 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 go. And, and people are around you all the time, and I get like 15 minutes to like read the Bible. And all right, cool, I can survive that way. We're on a mission trip. But if that's your life, that you just get five minutes a day or even nothing, you're just thinking about God throughout the day, randomly, you know, you might read our daily bread or some little devotional, and then you just, bam, go with your day. That's not enough. That's like a starvation diet it's spiritually. So you need time with God. I recommend at least an hour. If you want to be radical about it, try to do a tithe of your day. And maybe, you know, what I did when I was in college, I, uh, you know, college students are so, so good at thinking that they're really busy and, um, and, and completely clueless about re- reality. Um, when I was in college, I, so I, re- I, I was smarter than some, and I realized I have a lot of time. So Friday afternoons, I would set aside, you know, I couldn't, I couldn't meet with God for many, multiple hours every day. But I think I did, I did an hour every day, and then Fridays I said, I'm going to spend four hours with God on Fridays. And it was awesome. I would spend four hours, just get the Bible out, I'd be in my room by myself, put some worship music on with the headphones, and just study the scriptures, listen to God, sit before God, worship God. It was so good. So maybe, maybe you're like, okay, maybe I, I could do an hour a day, but... But, but, but once in a while, I can do more than that. Okay, go for it. Or maybe you're like, man, I, all I can do is half hour. Okay, start with half hour, and then if you do it right, you're going to want more. You're going to want more. But I, you know, I do highly recommend at least an hour a day. Start with that. Um, and if you've got to get up earlier, get up earlier. You know, we fill our lives with so many useless things. And then we complain. We're like, man, I'm so tired all the time, and I don't have any time. Yeah, stop watching movies. Lay off the Facebook. Stop watching the news. You can carve out so many different things, but what you do all the time, not, what people do all the time, is they go, they, they get rid of prayer. They get rid of spending time with God. They get rid of the Bible. Don't do that. That's your life. You need time with the Father. Amen. All right. So that's simple thing number five. Just do it. Um, you know, it's, it, it's simple. Um, but we actually have to do it to get the blessing from it. Um, number six, smile. Or if you need something a little more uh, religious sounding, make the conscious decision to rejoice in God. Um, <laughs> for, for those of you out there who are a little more religious. Psalm 103, uh, starting in verse 1, King David wrote, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Many times in the Psalms, and, um, David, David and the other uh, psalmists write things like this. Bless the Lord, O my soul. David is telling his soul, which seems weird to us. He's saying, yo, David, bless the Lord. <laughs> we need that, though. We need to make a conscious de- decision to tell ourselves, Jake, praise God. Jake, rejoice in God. Um, you're if you can live your day where you're going, you're letting the emotions come and, and you're just feeling whatever the emotions tell you to feel and you're letting the actions dictate how you respond. That's one way to live life. But here King David shows us a different way that you tell yourself, no, you worship God. You praise God. You rejoice in God. You, you do what the scriptures say. And so we, we, this is the idea of smile or rejoice in God no matter what, is that you have to make the conscious decision, I'm going to praise God. I'm going to rejoice in God. And um, if you do that, it will make life a hundred times easier. Um, Okay, bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Again, it's a conscious thing where he's saying, it's an active thing where he's saying, don't forget. He's telling himself, David, don't forget all the good things from God. Remember that. If if you just kind of You can live your life where you're letting things happen and flowing from one thing to the next. You're going to forget God's benefits. You're going to ignore how good he is. You have to consciously make the decision, I'm going to remember that God's good. I'm going to remember to praise him. I'm going to remember to smile because he is awesome and he loves me. Uh, Verse 3. So then he lists some of the benefits here. Who forgives all your iniquity, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy, who satisfies you with good so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. Life life is hard. Life is not easy, but it's a hundred times easier if you get things right in your head, if you get your heart right, where if you choose to rejoice no matter what, to bless God, to praise God, and have the right attitude, life gets so much easier. Uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse, verse 16, uh, uh, verses that are probably not a surprise to any of you. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. 
Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. You know, not only is this God's will for you, um, and to, to be thankful in everything, to rejoice in everything, but in doing so, I love this next verse. Um, it says, do not quench the spirit. When you choose to rejoice always, to, to pray without ceasing, to give thanks in everything, then you're allowing the Holy Spirit to come into the situation. You're giving freedom to the Holy Spirit. The word quench, it's like you can, you can take a candle and you can quench the flame. You can snuff the flame of the candle. Um, when, you, when, you, when you're not rejoicing, when you're allowing whining, complaining, bad attitude, uh, fear, crankiness, when you're allowing that to dictate how you live, um, then you end up quenching the Holy Spirit in your life. We want the Spirit. We want Him to move. We want His freedom. We want His love. So rejoice. It's, a, it's an easy thing to do, to just tell yourself, look, be happy. God is good. Um, practically speaking, what does this mean? What are some things we can do? Well, one is think positive. There's a, you know, you could take this to a weird extreme. Like, uh, I'll pick on Greg. I was not here for this story, um, for this situation, but I've heard it from Greg himself and others. Um, apparently, the I don't know the whole situation. Greg can tell you all the details, but um, the, it looked a little bit, we had an outdoor event or something, and, and it looked a little bit like rain, and as people walked outside, they realized, oh, well, it started raining, and then Greg points up and goes, I don't receive the rain. <laughs> and then somebody you know, said to Greg, well, receive it or not, you know, it's raining on you. Um, so we could take this positive thinking thing to a weird extreme where you're like, all right, it's all about my mind. I'm going to think positive, and then positive things will happen. And even when negative things are happening, I'm going to pretend they're positive. That's not what this is about. This is about focusing on what is good. Um, Philippians chapter 4, verse 8. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. You, to, have, to have joy in your heart, to be happy, one of, the, uh, one of the easy practical things to do is guard your mind. Make sure that you're thinking about good things, things that build you up, things of God. Um, if you're always filling your mind with new, new uh, COVID variants, corrupt politicians, BLM, Antifa, Marxism, uh, Disney destroying Star Wars. <laughs> if you're filling your mind with garbage, you're going to have a lot harder time to rejoice. So fill your mind with good things. Think about good things. Focus on Jesus and the things that he's doing. Um, okay, another practical thing you can do is just literally just smile. Even if you're feeling bad, just smile. It will make you feel better. Look at Brian. He looks so happy now. <laughs> You can't see Brian. I can. What a happy guy. <laughs> so, <laughs> so seriously, there's, there's been a number of studies, um, very interesting studies. I read way too many of them this last week um, um, that were done to figure out, is it that you feel happy, therefore you smile, or you smile and that makes you feel happy? And um, there's an interesting correlation where it does go both ways. Um, not entirely, but they found, uh, especially the 70s and 80s, there were a lot of studies um, looking at what smiling does. And one of the, this was the most interesting to me, and I, I tried it out and it worked on me. Um, they had um, um, subjects, um, they told them to make an E noise, like E, well in doing that, it, mimic, it uses the same muscles that a smile makes. E, and to make an a U noise, like, which mimics the same uh, muscles that, that you use when you're making like, a, a pouting face. So E, U. You guys can all try E, U. E, U. Okay, so across the board, when people were doing this, <laughs> what a weird church. <laughs> um, <laughs> oh. <laughs> um, so, 100% of these study subjects reported feeling slightly happier when they were going E than when they went U, and they felt slightly sadder when they went U. I tried it, it worked on me. And I'm like, that's really weird, but it works. Um, it's, they had some reasons for it. They said well, they think maybe like, um, the muscles constrict blood flow and change the temperature of the brain. And, I don't know, but um, they had their random theories. Maybe they're true, maybe they're not. Um, but it worked on me, and it worked on 100% of the study subjects. There's something that when you smile, it does force you to be happy. Whether it's like psychologically, you go, oh, I must be happy because I'm smiling, or it's a muscular thing, or, or just a supernatural spirit thing. I don't know, but it, 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 it works. 
smile. And not only will it make you happier, it'll make people around you happier because they see you and they go, wow, you must be happy. Hey, maybe there's something to be happy about. Maybe I'll be happy too. And then you just have happy, happy, happy everywhere. <laughs> All right, that's a good segue to the next one, laugh. Um, there was a guy that we met in Romania, Alex Grigorescu, Brian and Kathy met him. He's like a bull in a china shop. Loves Jesus, but wow, bull in a china shop. Um, so he's one of the most happy people I know, but he came to me one day um, and he said, brother, it's unscriptural to laugh. It's unscriptural to be happy as Christians. And I'm like, okay, well, what about this person, this person, this person, this person? And he's like, okay, well, besides those. <laughs> So, but really, this, we have this, some people have this weird attitude that, okay, now you're a Christian, now you have to be very serious, and the more serious you are, the more religious you are, the more serious you have to be, and it's not okay to laugh. That's so not biblical. Um, uh, Psalm 45, 7 talks about that Jesus was anointed with the oil of joy, the oil of gladness beyond his companions. If Jesus, Jesus understood sin and the stupidity of people better than any of us ever will, and if he could be so joyful that, that, that the, uh, the psalmist wrote about him that he's anointed with the oil of joy more than anybody else. If he could be that joyful, man, we, we should be able to walk in some joy because we're, we're, we're freed from sin and we don't get it how bad sin is. We don't understand how stupid people are. We think we do, but no, we don't. We don't even understand how stupid we are. We think we're smart. That's how, that's how bad we get it. <laughs> um, I'm reading this great book now called The Humor of Christ. Um, and it's it, one of the fascinating things that I've been, been seeing in here is, you know, I, I've, I've, I've known for a while that Jesus said some jokes, but this author is pointing out um, just how often Jesus used humor. Um, and he often used humor in two main ways, I'm seeing. Uh, one is to show truth, and the other one is to uh, counteract attacks from religious people and from crabby people. Um, so it's, it's kind of like the Babylon Bee. <laughs> um, humor is very effective. And um, it's very disarming, too. If somebody comes at you all upset, no, 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 and then you just whip out a funny thing in response to that that also, like, pricks their heart and shows them some truth, it's totally disarming. They, they don't know what to do with that. But if you get mad and start arguing, okay, they, they, they're ready for that. So Jesus is using humor all the time. Um, so laugh. It's okay to think things are funny. It's okay to read the Babylon Bee and laugh about it. It's, you know, don't, don't just watch some stupid comedy just because it's, gar it's garbage and you might snicker a little. Watch, but, but it's, a, you know, we watched, we watched the, the movie, uh, was it Game Night a few years ago? Oh my gosh, I laughed my head off. Um, it, it's not a Christian movie at all, and I'm sure there's some bad things in there. I don't remember them. I just, but we were laughing and laughing, and afterwards we got out of the movie, and I'm like, man, I feel like God is around me. This is awesome. That, God's not in the movie. He's not, you know, it's not a Christian movie at all. But just that when you laugh, it helps get you out of that funk, feeling depressed and discouraged. And um, so, you know, it, it can be, it can be helpful to just, just to laugh. Why, look at the far side or Calvin and Hobbes or something. They're great, good, clean, funny stuff. Um, and Proverbs 17, 22, so this is actually biblical. Uh, Proverbs 17, 22 says, A joyful heart is good medicine, but a crushed spirit dries up the bones. When, when you choose to be joyful and even laugh, that can help you through difficulties. And if you just stay stuck in this funk, depressed, di discouraged, stressed out, confused, um, you don't see a way out. And so sometimes God, he can, he can bring you out of it just by, by laughing. And, and uh, side note with this, um, or sub note under laughing, laugh at yourself. Uh, sometimes we get so serious, like we make a mistake, and we're like, how could I do that? I can't, I can't believe I was so dumb. And God's looking at you going, I can. <laughs> Why are you surprised? <laughs> Just laugh at yourself. You made a mistake. It's okay. You're just, you're, I know we try to be perfect and we want to do everything awesome, but it's okay. You're still human. Laugh. You say, man, that was dumb. And then, then you know, then you can even, Brian can teach you about dumb guy, um, the scapegoat. Because um, clearly we would not, we, I would not be dumb. I'm smart. But this dumb guy who looks like me and he starts doing these things. Brian can tell you more about dumb guy. He invented dumb guy, I think, right? Or he just came into your life. <laughs> but you can't get rid of them, though. He just shows up and does stuff. <laughs> yeah, I think... I know. I know, right? And, like, he just keeps coming and coming. <laughs> uh, all right. Uh, another one under uh, Be Joyful, uh, Sing to God. Psalm 22, 3. 
It says, yet you are holy, you know, sing, uh, uh, writing about God. It says, yet you, God, are holy, enthroned on the praises of Israel. As we praise God and as we sing to God, it's like we are putting God on the throne. God's always on the throne. But when we praise his name and when we sing to him, it's like we are, we're declaring in the spirit, you are God. You're worthy of praise. You're worthy of glory. And when he's on the throne, his kingdom comes, his dominion comes, his rule comes, which includes joy, peace, love, all these good things. So sing to God. Um, another one, final one on this uh, uh, joyful part. Dance before God. You know, don't worry. You know, some of you are like, man, what's, what's he getting into? This is weird now. Well, yeah, I guess it is a little bit weird. But um, there was a, there's this great line from an old uh, healing evangelist called Smith Wigglesworth. He was around in the uh, late 1800s, early 1900s. Some people call him the Apostle of Faith. He's got some incredible testimonies of people that were healed through his ministry and um, just a man who walked in in faith. And um, he says, I don't ever ask Smith Wigglesworth how he feels. I jump up out of bed. I dance before the Lord for at least 10 to 12 minutes, high-speed dancing. I jump up and down and run around my room telling God how great he is, how wonderful he is, how glad I am to be associated with him and to be his child. Yeah, I love that. He said he did that every morning. That's, that's, that was his routine. He'd get up and just start dancing before God. There, uh, a, couple, a couple nights ago, I had this dream. I think it was a little bit inspired by the Charlie Brown Christmas movie because we rewatched that as a family. And... Um, I love, I love, I've mentioned this before, but I love it when they're, um, he's just jamming on piano and everybody's there just like doing their stupid dances. And, and so I love that scene. Um, that's like worship to me right there. Um, so I had this dream that we as a church, we got together for worship and people were doing those stupid dances. And it, it was awesome. <laughs> and like I remember looking out, Naomi, my daughter Naomi, she was doing this like weird monkey dance thing. And like everybody had these really just awful, stupid dances. But we were worshiping God. It was so fun. And like I'm having this dream and I woke up. I was like, that was awesome. We need to do that. Not, I'm not going to make you do that next Sunday or anything. But um, maybe, maybe I will, maybe I won't. I don't know. Dumb guy might come and make you do it. <laughs> But you know what? You wake up in the morning, instead of like rolling out of bed, and you're like, oh, man, things are sore. What did I do? I don't remember doing anything other than sleeping last night. How the heck does my spleen hurt? Instead of going right to that, you wake up, you're like, yeah, Jesus, I love you. You start dancing a little bit, put on some worship music, and just praise God. That will focus, will set the direction of your day way better than starting off crabby and complaining. Amen? All right, that was number six. Number seven. This one's short. Um, I could talk longer, but I won't. Uh, just show up. Um, and I'm going to be honest, this has been uh, par partly coming out of frustration at the number of people that promise to do things and don't do it, or promise to be there and they're not there, or, or people that have said, oh man, I feel like God's got a call in my life. I really want to do something, and I really want to do this and that, but someday I feel, really feel like, man, God's got a destiny for me. And then I say, well, why don't you come to the Bible study? Or why don't you come to the home group? Why don't you come to church? And they go, yeah, I don't know, man. It's really hard to get to church. Okay, so you want to be a missionary in Zambia and, and, and plant churches all over that nation, and yet you can't roll out of bed and get to church? <laughs> Just show up. Um, I've been really blessed by uh, John, John Schuler um, over the past few months where he's had this ha attitude in a lot of ways. You know, we started the worship stuff. And he's like, I'm not really a singer. I'm loud, and I don't know what, what I'm doing. I'm like, I don't either, so join the club. <laughs> and he just showed up. I said, well, why don't you just come? We'll try, you know, practicing some worship, see what happens. He showed up, and all right, now he's helping out. Steven, same thing. Uh, Dave on the piano. He's like, I don't know how to play piano, but there's a piano. And I learned a couple chords. I know a few notes. And, and I said, why don't you just show up? Just come for worship practice. We'll see how it goes. And it, that, you just have to come. Just show up, and you don't know. You don't know where God's going to lead you in the end. You don't know what the final destination is or how he's going to get you there. But if you, if you just stay in your sphere where everything's comfortable, I'm in control, I know what I'm doing, and I'm safe here, these are the people I like, and, 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 which is mostly just me, and I'm by myself, and everything's okay here. If you stay like that, you're never going to change from that. You're always going to be stuck there. You have to change something. And maybe you're like, look, I don't even know. I don't know how to run the coffee bar, or I don't know how to sing on the worship team, or I don't know how to uh, fix something on the building, or how to do a, uh, lead a home group, or whatever, but you just say, look, I'll come, I'll try, I'll show up on the first day of the home, you know, I'll open my house and start doing this home group, or I'll show up for worship practice, and then God, 
then God can lead you to the next step and he can equip you, but he's not going to give you the equipping and the power to do it until you just show up. So um, I want to encourage you, just show up, whatever it is. You know, um, Joe, Joe has blessed me too recently where um, he said, I, I mentioned a few months ago about um, needing some help with the website and the YouTube stuff. And uh, I've, I've been doing it, but it's kind of a hassle. And, um, and Joe said, I don't know anything about that, but I'm willing to try if you show me what to do. That's, that's all you got to do for a lot of stuff. Just show up, just give it a shot, and, and God will then equip you. But if you're waiting for everything to fall into place and angels to come and, and um, you know, the 24 elders around the throne to, to, to usher you in to the pl- great plan of God, it's not going to happen that way. It's just you decide, I'm going to come and, and let God lead. Amen. Just show up. All right. Number eight, guard your mind. Again, this I could preach for week after week on this, um, guarding your mind. Um, but I'm going to try to make it quick. And this is not necessarily, this is kind of a cheater one here. Guarding your mind is, while it's simple, it's not necessarily easy. Um, it's something that you will war with your entire life. You know, it's, it's not so, like a box you can check and say, sweet, got that done. Let's move on to cleaning my room now. Um, it's simple, but it's, it's, it's hard. It's a war. Um, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 3, Paul writes, But I am afraid that just as Eve was deceived by the serpent's cunning, your minds may somehow be led astray from your sincere and pure devotion to Christ. So Paul, he points out a really important truth here. So Eve, the devil, the serpent deceived Eve, and through that, what happened? Sin entered the world. Before that, everything was beautiful and perfect. Humanity had never sinned. They didn't even know sin. It was all awesome paradise everywhere. All sin had its beginning through the serpent deceiving Eve. And how did that happen? In her thoughts. He says that, he says that he's concerned that just as the serpent deceived Eve, that your mind, your thoughts will be led astray from your sincere and pure devotion to Christ. The battle, the principal battle that you face is in your mind. Um, guarding your thoughts, um, winning that war in your thought life. So how do you, how do you guard your mind? Um, the simple, you know, we could talk week after week about this, but one simple strategy is take your thoughts captive. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, so the, the, the chapter before this one, um, chapter 10, verse 5, Paul says, We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ. If a thought enters your mind, don't just receive it. You know, thoughts come and thoughts go. You, you'll hear thoughts from God, thoughts from the devil, thought, well, demons, thoughts from yourself, thoughts, you know, thoughts will enter your mind all the time. Don't just receive those. Just because a thought is in there doesn't make it true, and it doesn't make it something that will bless you. Um, so as a thought comes into your mind, what you want to do is you want to take it captive, and, and, and it says here, take every thought captive to obey Christ. So you want to grab a hold of that thought. You get a thought, and you go, okay, I got that. And sometimes if I'm having a real struggle with this, I'll actually visualize myself in my mind, like grabbing a hold of, a hold of the thought, and then I bring it to Jesus, and I see him on the throne, Picture him on the throne. I see myself taking that thought and putting it at the feet of Jesus. And I say, can you make this obey you, God? Because I don't feel like this is obeying you right now. Um, so you want to grab that thought and you go, okay, Jesus, I'm giving this to you. Is this obedient to you? Is this thought good? Is this something you want me to have? Or is this thought in conflict what you want? Is it conflicting with the scriptures? Um, an example you know, uh, would be, let's say I'm here at church and uh, you come in and I don't say hi to you. Maybe I'm busy, I'm distracted, um, I'm tired, I don't know, maybe I'm doing something else, I don't say hi to you. And so this thought comes into your mind, man, Jake doesn't like me. Jake probably hates me. Man, I can't stand this church. I need to leave this church. This church, that pastor doesn't know what he's doing. Okay, rather than just hearing that and saying, yeah, I guess that's true, I'm leaving the church because Jake hates me and I should be mad at him too. Rather than doing that, you grab that thought and you go, hey Jesus, what do you think about this thought? Is this good? And Jesus will probably say, no, that thought's crap. Don't, don't listen to that. Um, you know, uh, that he might put some, some verses in your mind, like uh, uh, I wrote some here, some examples. He might say, well, 1 Corinthians 13, 7 says you need to, that love believes all things. You've got to walk in love, so believe the best. Believe that maybe he just didn't see you. Maybe, maybe he thought you were somebody else. Maybe, I don't know, maybe, whatever. Believe love believes all things, and you, you walk in love, believe the best in that situation. And if that's good enough, he might say, 1 Peter 4.8, uh, love covers a multitude of sins. He might say, yeah, Jake's just being crabby today. Give him some grace. He's human too. So let your love cover the multitude of sins that you see in him right now where he's just crabby at you. You love him back. 
Um, you know, whatever it is, you want to take this thought and you want to give it to Jesus and say, what do I do with this Jesus? How, does this line up with the scriptures? And if he says, yeah, this is biblical, then you grab a hold of that. You go, awesome, all right. But if, but if you give it to Jesus and, and then, then you realize this is not biblical. This thought goes against what the Bible teaches. It goes against what I know is right. It goes against the heart of God. It goes against the nature of Jesus. Then don't hold on to it. You don't got, no, no, nobody's got time for that. Just throw it out. Get rid of that thought. Don't let it dwell around, you know, roll around in your mind. Just get rid of it and choose to do the opposite of what this unbiblical thought is telling you to do. That's taking your thoughts captive. Uh, does, that, does that make sense? Yeah. All right. So we, we need to guard our minds. We need to fight this war in, in our thought life um, because out of our thoughts come, you know, evil words, evil actions, evil um, emotions, evil, uh, all, all the evil and sin, it originates in, in our thoughts. That's where the primary battle takes place. Um, okay, so let's go on to simple thing number nine. And this also is simple. Yeah, what? I'm You're at 10? Yeah. You're at 10. Maybe. Smile I... and laugh separate? No, those are the same. Oh, okay. Because you can smile and laugh at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, yeah. That was 10.3 <laughs> or, or 7 point, whatever. <laughs> I don't know what it was. Uh, anyway, all right, simple thing number nine, get your family in order. Um, and this is something that also, it's simple, but it's hard. It's not easy. Um, so my, let me share some of my upbringing here. So I, I grew up in, a, I think, a pretty typical American church-going family. We would go to church well, at least once a month. Sometimes, sometimes it was a few times a month. Sometimes it, for a little, for periods of time, it was like even every week. Um, and we thought of ourselves as Christians, and um, we were, but but we were not. We didn't love. None of us loved God at all um, when I was a kid. Um, my parents would fight all the time. My dad would say just belittling, demeaning things to my mom. My mom would argue with my dad, and rather than and not listen to him, not respect him try to manipulate and control him. And so there was this constant warfare between my parents. Not like, I mean, it's, it's not like they were throwing stuff at each other, but like typical American couples type thing, um, non-Christian. Um, and so they would fight with each other. And then uh, us as kids, you know, we would always try to manipulate my parents. We'd be whining, complaining, throwing fits, trying to get what we wanted, trying to pull their emotions so that we, we, we get what we want. Um, and then they were, my parents didn't really... They didn't train us. They would either yell at us and try to like, like make us afraid of them so that we'd do what they want us to do, but then the next day they might want us to do the opposite, so we were very confused. They would either yell at us, make us afraid, or just kind of try to be our best friends and like laugh, make jokes, and just, just yeah, be a friend with us, but they didn't try to really train us at all. And so, you know, this pretty typical American non-Christian family, I think. Um, so my, my whole perception of how a family should be was like that, that you should have turmoil, frustration, and even us siblings. We'd fight with each other all the time and try to compete, and, and um, nobody was being honest, and, no, and then people were getting offended. And it was just, it's just garbage kind of family stuff, dysfunctional family, like most people's non-Christians' families are. Um, and so when I came to God, I had no idea about what a real family should look like, what a real godly family should look like. My conception of family was screwed up. And so um, I, you know, I thank God that he put me in a church. Uh, we had a cornerstone church in Madison at the time, and I saw a number of really good godly families. And I, um, I would watch them. I would see how the husband is with his wife, how the wife is with her husband, how the kids are, how the parents are with the kids. I would watch that, not in like a creepy way. Like, <laughs> I would, I would pay attention, you know, because I wanted to have a good family. So I would watch how these families were. And then I come here to Oconomowoc, and I see more good families in, the, in, in our church here. And I'm always, like, watching, observing, taking notes, and then sometimes seeing bad stuff. And it's going, well, I'm not going to do that. Um, but, but, but always trying to learn, because I wanted to have a good family. And, and, it, and part of what I did for probably about six months as a college student, you know, I talked about my four hours every Friday when I would spend time with God and study the Bible, uh, for probably about six months, what I did was I studied family and, and, and just looked at verses on the family and husbands and wives and children and all that because I really wanted to know what does the Bible say about this and I didn't want to have a screwed up family like, my, like I grew up in. Um, and my dad, my, my, my dad loves me, my dad loved us, my, my mom loves us and, and um, they, you know, they did the best they could and I love my parents and I realize now that I'm a parent too, um, it, Back when I was a college student, I judged them a lot. And I thought, wow, my parents are screwed up. Now, but then when I became a parent, I realized, yeah, it's easy to be a screw up. <laughs> 
So I have a lot of mercy for them. And they were non-Christian. They didn't know any better. Their parents were even worse. So, you know, um, they didn't know any better. They didn't, they didn't. No, I didn't get the parents' manual. Yeah. When does that, do you ever get that? It's after the 16th. No. <laughs> Um, yeah, no parents' manual. <laughs> um, all right, that's why you got to have a lot of kids, because the first one you really screw up, and then, all right, finally we got it right. Um, not serious there. All right, Ephesians, uh, so the Bible, the Bible, though, is awesome because, for a lot of things, but the Bible really does give very practical, practical advice on how to get your family in order. Husbands and wives, how to treat each other, um, parents with their children. Um, it gives very practical advice that, unfortunately, most of the Western world is railing against, that they see what the Bible says and they don't, they don't want it. They fight against it. But if you, and some people, some, many Christians have surrendered to that mindset without realizing it. And, I, and, and so we need to be on a constant guard to believe what the Bible says. And if we do it, if we believe what the Bible says and we trust that God knows better, this is what he said to do, so just do it. If you do that, you will be blessed. If you fight it, because I don't like it, and well, people think I'm strange and I don't want that. If you fight that, you will not have the joy and the peace that you want in your family. That's just reality. So you can surrender to what God says and do it that way, be blessed, or you can fight it and struggle through life and we still will love you and I don't care who you are I still will love you but your family life will not work the way you want you'll be frustrated until you surrender to how God said to do it amen okay so let's go to Ephesians I have a kind of a longer section here but it's just really good Ephesians chapter 5 verse 22 wives submit to your own husbands as to the Lord for the husband is the head of the wife even as Christ is the head of the church his body and is himself its savior now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. So Paul here, he gives a message primarily focused on the wives, but the husbands are involved as well. He says, wives, your job, you submit to your husband. You don't get to call the shots. And I know this is not popular in our culture nowadays that people want to say, well, we're all the same and it's not, it's not good to you know, have to submit. And I want to be in charge. And why can't a woman be in charge? I'm sorry, I didn't write the Bible. God, this is in the scriptures. This is how it is. This is how God des designed this. I'm not really sorry. Um, this is how God made it. So you want to do it his way or do you want to fight about it and do it your way? It's up to you. But this is what the Bible says. Wives, you submit. But also you husbands, you don't get to be lazy. You don't get to not lead. It's easy. I would love to not lead. I would love to just be able to play video games. I don't really play video games, but I would love to do other stuff and say, hey, woman, you just get it done. You lead. You go work. You make the money. You figure out the plan. You take care of our family because I just want to take a nap. That would be wonderful, but I don't get that option. I'm the husband. I have to lead. You husbands, you have to lead. You don't get the option to just let your wife, force your wife to do it all. And wives, you don't get to manipulate and try to control and dominate over your husband. You submit, he leads. That's the way God made it. You can surrender to it and be blessed, or you can fight it and struggle your whole life. I'll love you either way, but you will be more blessed if you do what the Bible says. Amen. Okay. Uh, next verse. Um, verse 25, Paul really shifts gears to deal with the husbands. Um, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any, any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. And remember, this is God talking about husbands. This is how you're supposed to view your wives, how you're supposed to treat your wives. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church. Husbands, you don't get to just lord it over your wife, push your wife around, and act like some redneck hillbilly. With, okay, I'll stop there. <laughs> you need to love your wife. You need to love your wife as Christ loved the church. What did Jesus do to love the church? He died for the church. He did everything for the church, and he continues to do to surrender himself for the church. You husbands, you need to give your lives for your wife. You don't get to, you know, you get your paycheck and you don't get to go, well, I made this money. I'm going to do whatever I want with this. If I want to buy a new snowmobile, I'm buying a new snowmobile and that's just the end of it. I don't care what that woman does. She's got her own money. Let her get a better job. No, you love your wife as Christ loved the church. And if, 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 you're, if your wife's like, I really don't feel like we need a snowmobile, but it'd be good to pay rent, maybe you pay rent <laughs> instead of buying that snowmobile. Uh, surrender. Deny, the, lay your life down for your wife. And the second part, so he says, love your wife as Christ loved the church, and he gave his life for the church. The second part is love your wife as your own body. 
You know, you take care of your body. When you're tired, you, you take a nap. When you're hungry, you eat. We, we love our own bodies. We cherish our own bodies. We care for our own bodies. You love your wife the same. You care for her the same. Okay, uh, next up. If, then we go to Ephesians 6. So it's right out. Paul gives this whole, um, this whole section here. It's all about families. And so he talks about the wives. Now he's got the husbands. And now he goes into the parents and children. Uh, Ephesians 6, verse 1. Children, obey your parents and the Lord, for this is right. Mm -hmm. Honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with a promise, that it may go well with you and that you may live long in the land. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Um, again, it's a, he starts out talking about the children. But, then he, but, but it includes the parents, the fathers, the mothers. And he says, all right, you kids, you obey your parents. You don't call the shots. You don't get to lead in your home. You don't get what you want because you don't see things the way that your parents see it. So stop making it hard for them. Stop fighting. Stop throwing fits. Stop arguing. Stop complaining. Stop obeying just the letter of the law but not the heart of it. Stop weaseling around trying to get, manipulate and get what you want. Just obey. Your parents are smarter. They're, they know what, they see the big picture and they care about you more than you care about yourself. So just surrender to it and obey. But then he says, you fathers, and I would include, uh, you know, fathers and mothers here. I don't know for sure, but I'm a, uh, I would guess that the Greek word here, so in, in Romanian, fathers can be used for fathers and mothers in certain senses. And I would guess that possibly the Romanian here as well. But um, but regardless, okay, those training, those raising the kids up, the fathers, the fathers and mothers, don't just provoke them. Don't, you're not their drill sergeant. You're not, you're not their best friend just to have a good time with them, and you're not their drill sergeant or their boss slave driver to make them do all this stuff. You are raising up children who will become adults, who will worship God, love God, be disciples of Jesus, and raise up their own children who will worship God, love God, and be disciples of Jesus. So you train them up, raise them up, build them up. You're not there just to dictate and make them do everything. Your job, and to anger them and frustrate them, your job to, is, is, in gentleness is to raise them up so that now they are strong, mature disciples of Jesus. Amen. Husbands, so in summary, husbands, you, you need to lead in the home and love your wives. Wives, you need to submit to and respect your husbands, children. You need to obey your parents. Parents, you need to train your children. Um, and lastly, married couples, you need to have kids. Um, you know, I know there are medical situations and things involved where people are like, well, I just can't have kids. Um, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about an attitude that has overtaken America, the Western world. Um, the birth rate in the Western world is declining rapidly. And this past year, there were surveys done among, uh, I think it was 18 to 39 year olds. Um, they do these surveys repeatedly. Um, but um, so this year, um, they, they asked 18 to 39 year olds um, to respond on whether or not they thought that they would have kids at any time. And it, I don't remember the st statistic exactly, but I think it was like 40% or 50 or even 60% said that they plan on never having kids. Um, it's the highest that it's ever been. So we see, we have this cultural mindset in the West that kids are a burden, kids are a chore. Why would I want kids? I don't want to bring kids into this screwed up world and I don't know what I'm, my childhood was terrible. Why would I introduce other people into that? Bring, bring other people into, you know, the, do the same thing that I went through. Um, and so, so our culture is looking at kids like a burden and, and like something that's not good. And this, this is something that we have to choose, we have to decide we're not going to think that way. That's not a biblical response. Um, and unfortunately, I see Christians with that attitude. It, it, Romania was really bad with this. We had, so I think we had the max kids. We, we started with four kids in Romania. By the time we left, we had six. All the time, we would have people come up to us and say, why would you have so many kids? Oh, how do you survive at home? How do you manage? And I'm looking at their one kid and going, yeah, I wouldn't manage with your one, so I'll take my six. <laughs> but, you know, they would go up to us and go, wow, what a burden. What a chore. How do you, how, why did, and some people were mad at us. And they'd say, like, well, could you imagine the carbon footprint? And we already have overpopulation on this planet, and you're just adding to it. I'm like, Wow, it's just so unbiblical. And some of these were Christian, what people call themselves Christians. Some, some yeah, I really think they were. And then others, it was just cultural Christians. Um, but we, we in, in America, too, um, we have the same attitude. It's not biblical. Psalm 127, and you can see it, you know, I'm just going to read this one um, chapter, but there, you can read throughout the scriptures, Old Testament and New, that children are a blessing, that children are from God. And um, um, we, have, we have this amazing responsibility. So God has given 
the ability to make human life to only one other being besides himself. That's us. That's married couples. And if, it's this amazing gift and amazing responsibility and amazing blessing. And if you, God has made you able to do this. You know, maybe there's a physical problem. That's a different issue. But if, if God has given you, everything's working, functioning right. And if you look at God and you say, I don't really want this. Thanks for the privilege of being able to create human life just like you. And I'm the only, we're the only types of people, that, the only types of being that can do that. Thank you. I, I appreciate that. But I don't really want that. No, that's not the heart of God. That's not the heart that we should have. Um, all right, Psalm 127. Unless the Lord builds the house, those who build, it in, those who build it labor in vain. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. It is in vain that you rise up early and go late to rest, eating the bread of anxious toil, for he gives to his beloved sleep. So the psalm, it starts out saying, essentially, um, unless God's in it, it's not going to work. So get God in it. Do it God's way. Let God guard the city. Let God build the house because you, you want to submit yourself to God's plan. Trust that God knows what he's doing. Do it his way. Even if you think you know better, do it God's way because otherwise it's not going to function. And then it shifts to specifically address um, families and having children. Verse 3, Behold, children are a heritage from the Lord, the fruit of the womb, a reward. Like arrows in the hand of a warrior are the children of one's youth. Blessed is the man who, who fills his quiver with them. He shall not be put to shame when he speaks with his enemies in the gate. God has given us an amazing privilege as, as married couples that we can have children. And those children, it's not just that God's like, sweet, yeah, I want to see a lot of little kids running around. No, he, he sees those kids as arrows that you're going to shoot out into the enemy's domain. You know, the, I was listening to a teaching a, a couple weeks ago um, about this, and the guy, he was saying that, like he, and, and I, I agree with this, I've thought this for a long time, Brian, same thing, that we're not just raising up kids so that we can f have, you know, more bodies on the earth. We are raising up disciples of Jesus. We're raising up arrows that we're going to shoot out into the enemy's kingdom, strike, strike into the darkness, and cause the light to, 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 to vanquish the enemy. Um, you know, like my kids, and Brian feels the same with his kids, that I don't know where God will send them. You know, Naomi, I'll use her as an example right now. Um, Naomi is working at Scoop DeVille. I can't work as, I could work at Scoop DeVille, but it'd be really weird to be working with all these middle school and high school girls. Um, but Naomi's working over there. She's making friends, and she's able to be a light and able to share the gospel with people at Scoop DeVille that I'm never going to share with. Uh, May, my, my sister tells me that May, on a number of times, has shared the gospel with her cousins. Like, it'd be kind of weird. I mean, I guess I could with my cousins, but I feel weird. Like, I'm the big, scary uncle and a pastor, and I'm, like, telling you what you have to do with God. But May's, like, shared, shared about Jesus with her cousins. And, um, and she's talked about that. Our, her, my niece and nephew are thinking about Jesus in different ways, because May's doing that, and I can't do that. Um, Ileana, Ileana has talked about that one day she wants to have an orphanage. Um, in Africa, or maybe have a daycare here, specifically because she wants to bless kids and, and raise up, help kids to know the love of God. That's something I don't want to do <laughs> at all. <laughs> do I want to go visit her orphanage or daycare and just come and love kids for an hour or so? Yeah, I'll do that. But I'm not changing dirty diapers. I'm not dealing with bratty kids. Uh, <laughs> but she loves it. Um, your kid, you, God has given us as parents as couples, this amazing responsibility and privilege to, to make human life and raise up that human life to be a disciple of Jesus who, who, who builds the kingdom of God in ways that we as the parents will never be able to do. So don't shirk that responsibility. Don't just look at God and go, nah, I know you say it's a blessing. I know you say it's good. I know it's a responsibility. I don't really want that. It's not the right heart. Um, children are a blessing, so let's, uh, let's do it. So, um, all right, let's go to number 10 here, just to close up. Um, simple thing, number 10, stop it. <laughs> Last week I talked about um, the, uh, the get out of debt skit, SNL skit. Well, um, this, this is another YouTube video. You got to look up Bob Newhart, stop it. I don't know, was this SNL or just... Mad TV, okay, yeah. Um, oh my gosh, it's so good. So Bob Newhart, stop it. You gotta look that up on YouTube, it's hilarious. Um, I'll give you a quick rundown. So Bob Newhart, he's a psychologist and um, plays one on TV. Um, and uh, he's got this, this um, patient comes in and he's like, okay, what's your problem? How can I help you? And she says, well, I have this fear. It's a fear of being, I think it's a fear of being buried alive or something, right? 
in a box, yeah. being buried in a box. And he's like, well, I mean, has this ever happened to you? And that's why you're afraid of it? No, no, it's never happened to me. Do you have people who want to bury you in a box? And that's why you're afraid? No, no, no. And he's like, so it's completely irrational, right? And she's like, yeah, yeah. But it's just like it torments me. It controls my life. Wherever I am, I'm thinking about this. And he goes, okay, well, I, I, I've got a solution for you. Don't worry. I'm going to tell you some things. And if you do this, it will change your life. Um, it will help set you free from this. And she gets out a piece of paper and a pen, and she's ready to, to, to write down his instructions. And he goes, no, no, you can put that away. She's like, well, I want to remember. No, you, you remember. Don't worry. And she goes, okay, okay, what is it? She's getting all ready. And he goes, okay, you ready? Yeah. Stop it. <laughs> and she's like, wait, what? Stop it. Stop it. Stop thinking about it. Stop worrying that you're going to be buried in a box. You're not going to be buried in, buried in a box. Nobody gets buried in a box. Why are you worried about that stupid? Stop it. S-T-O-P-I-T. Just stop it. Whatever it you have that's holding you back, stop it. Just stop it. If it's, you know, fear, stop it. Stop being afraid. If it's sin, stop the sin. If you're, well, I don't, you know, you're fighting God on something, stop it. Just surrender. You're not doing this and you know you should. Well, okay, stop not doing it and start doing it. Whatever it there is, it's, you have the power to stop it. You have the power to, 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 to fix the problem. So just do it. Stop arguing, stop making excuses, stop fighting God, just stop it, receive his blessing, do what he wants, and, and be happy and blessed and victorious. Amen? Amen. <laughs> Amen. Jesus, thank you. Thank you that life, even though it's hard, it's, uh, it's not that complicated to be victorious and successful. And Lord, I'm not, um, in, even in this message, Lord, I, uh, I was reminded, uh, I, I'm thinking about areas where I have to change things. I have to stop it, and I have to do things different. So Father, I pray for your grace to be over all of us to do things biblically, to think biblically, to act biblically, and um, to make the ch small changes that we need to make to have a, a victorious life. In Jesus' name, amen.